Welcome everyone to Fossil's uh, Biotech uh, Seminar Series. Really excited to have Michael Levin here again. I discovered your work, I think, about five years ago in one of your New Europe's presentations on what bodies think about. I was totally startled by it. Could not believe what you were discussing there until we had you on, I think, two or three years ago for Fossil Seminar a while back. Also on, I think the topic was taming the collective intelligence of cells with a focus also on, on possible regeneration and longevity implications. Since then, I have contacted you quite a few times to ask if you want to nominate fellows uh, for Foresight because we really want to explore a little bit more the longevity and like bio angle uh, of much of your work. Since then, you have not stopped working. In fact, quite the opposite. You have now produced some really mind boggling bits on Xenobots and Anthrobots ever since. And so hopefully we may get into some of that also during the Q&A. And then most recently, you were on a Cognitive Revolution podcast and discussed some of the implications of your work for AI and especially for the new like, bio-inspired approaches to intelligence. That was really interesting. We have launched our AI safety grant since then. And many, not many, but a few of the applications actually actively referenced your work in their AI applications. So I'm just really excited to discuss, hopefully, uh, some of these things in the Q&A. But for now, please take it away. Thank you so much for joining. Today, you'll be discussing endogenous bio bioelectrical networks and interface to regenerative medicine. And hopefully, we can tease out some of the longevity implications uh, and some of the AI implications afterwards in the Q&A. Thanks a lot for joining. We are big fans of your work. And please take it away. Thank you so much. That's a very kind introduction. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm very excited to share some ideas with you. And what I'd like to uh, talk to you about is basically the following point, that I'm going to make the argument that bodies consist of a kind of multi-scale competency architecture. And the key uh, element of this is that there's problem-solving intelligence at every level, from the molecular networks to up to organs and swarms and so on. I'm going to make the argument that definitive regenerative medicine is really going to require us to exploit this collective intelligence. What it amounts to is communicating our anatomical goals in morphospace to the cells. And the particular uh, interface that we exploit is uh, the endogenous bioelectric uh, networks that are present in all tissues. These are, uh, this is an extremely uh, tractable and powerful interface for top-down control. And I'm going to show you the tools that we've made to read and write the pattern memories into what is basically the protocognitive medium of the collective intelligence of cells. I'm going to show you some uh, beginning applications in areas like birth defects, regenerative repair, cancer, and we can talk about how these are heading towards biomedicine. So in order to heal and restore function, we really need to understand the agential material we're working with because it's completely different than the kind of engineering we've done in the past. So for thousands of years, we worked with passive materials. And the thing about passive materials is that the only thing you can rely on them to do is to stay where you put them. And so it's on you as the engineer, like with, the, let's say, Legos or wood or metal, to put them exactly where you want them. And at best, they're going to remain there. And it's a, you, you have to be the one to implement all the different functionalities. But engineers have increasingly started working on with active matter and even computational materials. And for us, bioengineers and workers in regenerative medicine, we work in an agential material. And you can imagine right away how different that type of engineering is when you think about what it takes to build a tower out of Legos versus a tower out of dogs. If you build a tower out of Legos, it's very straightforward. You put everything where it goes. But if that tower falls over, that's the end. And you can't really expect it to do anything beyond that. The dogs initially are absolutely not going to stay where you put them, but they offer an amazing interface having to do with training and memory and learning. And if you train them to stand on top of each other, then once uh, you knock the tower over, they'll get back up and uh, they'll do the, the, the thing they're supposed to do. And so you can see the pros and cons of this. It's, it requires you to really understand your material to know which type of techniques you're going to use. And people argue a lot about this notion of whether bodies are actually machines, if there's a, a difference between machines and organisms. And I don't believe that these are absolute binary categories in any way. But what we want is a plethora of approaches at the right levels. You definitely want an orthopedic surgeon who believes your body is a machine because they get to use tools like this. They use chisels and screws and hammers and so on. But what you don't want is a psychoanalyst who thinks you're that kind of machine, right? And so different types of different types of problems require different levels of solution. And after the orthopedic surgeon does, does their thing, they then send you home to heal. And it is that part, the part that we don't micromanage, that is the really interesting part where the collective intelligence of the bodies really takes hold. And ultimately, we can discuss this at the end. I won't get into it here. But the people who work on placebo and nocebo effects and so on, like Fabrizio Benedetti says, words and drugs have the same mechanism of action. 
And this is extremely deep because what this is reminding us of is that there is a multi-scale architecture that has a language understanding at the top and all kinds of other levels eventually reaching the molecular level. And our body is, is actually an amazing architecture that lets your high-level executive goals, for example, social goals, scientific goals, and so on, to literally move calcium and other ions across your membranes in your cells so that you can walk and, and do voluntary motion and go about your day to try to achieve those goals. So our body has that kind of architecture that literally links a mental, long-range mental goals to the movement of chemicals that allow you to enact those goals. So uh, across this, uh, what I call the spectrum of persuadability, because it puts the emphasis on uh, how uh, we are going to use different types of tools to get the system to do various things. Across that spectrum of persuadability, we have many different waypoints. You have simple machines, you have uh, homeostats, and then you have learning agents, and then you have uh, rational thinkers and planners and so on, and uh, completely different sets of tools. So, so hardware rewiring here, and then cybernetics here, and, and maybe control theory, and then behavioral science, and then maybe other uh, interesting things like you know, psychiatry and so on. So one might ask the question, where do cellular collectives fit into this spectrum? The assumption, and I think most people make this assumption, is that it's got to be somewhere here, maybe a little bit here. But I, I want to really emphasize the idea that is very much an assumption. That is a, a philosophical commitment. The, the thing we need to do as scientists and engineers is do experiments. We need to find out where they fit. Because uh, I, my claim is that humans are actually not very good at guessing these things. So we need to do experiments. And, and that amounts to asking, what tools, in particular the tools of these other disciplines, are really powerful in getting cellular collectives to do interesting things. Now, as we start to talk about intelligence, it's important to work backwards. So here we are, if we believe that we are high-level metacognitive beings with true goals and memories and preferences and so on. So here we are. Where did all those things come from? Working backwards, both evolutionarily and developmentally, they came from here. We were all once a single unfertilized oocyte. So people look at this cell and they see a little blob of chemistry and they say that really just uh, obeys the laws of physics. There is no, no cognition there. But the, one, the deepest lesson of developmental biology is that there is no magic lightning flash during this process at which you go from being, quote unquote, just physics to uh, having a complex mind. So that means our goal, and, and, and we all make this journey across this uh, so-called Cartesian cut. So that means that uh, our goal is to really understand the scaling of minds. We really need to understand how the primitive competencies of molecular networks and single cells slowly but surely become large-scale competencies in new uh, problem, uh, problem spaces. And uh, this is uh, something that I think Turing actually understood quite well, although he didn't talk about it much, uh, that um, the self-assembly of the body and the self-assembly and the scale-up of minds is really the same problem. This is why the, the father of, of computer science, who thought a lot about intelligence and, and uh, mathematics and thinking and so on, also had a paper on self-organization of chemicals in an embryogenesis. I think he was on to this. This is the kind of stuff that we are made of. This is this happens to be a free living organism, but I just want to show you, this is a lacrimaria. I want to show you what a single cell is capable of. No, no brain, no nervous system. Everything is handled in one cell. So all of this animal's morphological, physiological, anatomical, metabolic needs are handled within one cell. And, and we have to ask ourselves the question, what connection policies are there for beings with their own agendas and their own competencies to get together and do larger scale things? Interestingly, it, it, intelligence does not appear first in whole cells. In fact, even gene regulatory networks, and you can see the details in these papers, even gene regulatory networks if you look at them correctly, or if you look at them the right way, you can actually discover six different kinds of learning that simple pathways can do. So no need for cells, no need for plasma membranes or, or any of that. Just a small number of nodes turning each other on and off is already sufficient to do things like associative conditioning. And that has massive implications for biomedicine, which we can talk about. So the first part of this talk, I want to focus on the competencies of the material. I want to really drill down and show off some of the amazing kinds of capabilities of the material that we're dealing with, because that bears on what kind of technologies are possible. Here's one example is that of, of, what, of the implications of being made of this kind of material. So this is a tadpole of the frog. You'll see a lot of those today. So here are the nostrils, here's the mouth, here's the brain, the gut. What you'll notice is that we've prevented the primary eyes from forming here, but we put an eye on his tail. 
And it turns out that this, these animals can see perfectly well. We test them in this machine that we built. We built a custom machine to train and test them on visual cues. They can see because they can learn to perform in these visual assays. This ectopic eye does not connect to the brain. It will often make us an optic nerve that can connect and synapse on the spinal cord here. So think about the amazing plasticity here. Without new generations of adaptation selection, this animal out of the gate with a completely different sensory motor architecture, that brain realizes that the information being put onto its spinal cord by this weird itchy patch of posterior tissue is good enough to, to understand its world as visual data and is able to process and, and behave accordingly. That plasticity is a major theme here. Another example of plasticity that dissolves the distinction between the memory and, and, and body structure can be seen in planaria. These flatworms, one of the main amazing characteristics that they have is that they regenerate. So you can cut them into pieces and they, each piece will give rise to a complete worm. So one thing that was known since the 60s is that if you train them on a particular task, for example, to look for food around these bumpy little, these laser etched little areas, so plate place conditioning, basically, you cut off their head and their centralized brain, the tail will sit there not doing anything other than growing a brand new head. And a little bit more than a week later, they've grown back a new head and you find out that these animals remember perfectly well where the liver was, which is what they eat. What we see here is the amazing ability to not only regenerate your memories, but to imprint the whatever information is present, presumably in the rest of the body, although we, we don't know yet where it is, but to imprint that information onto a newly growing brain. So think about what that might mean for future therapeutics when a patient with six or seven decades of memories, of personality, of, of history, suddenly has a, a large chunk of their brain replaced with the descendants of stem cells. In terms of, are you still going to get the same the same <clears throat> individual? Is it going to be more like a newborn baby? What these kind of models suggest that actually memories might persist quite well. In fact, it's even more impressive what happens in in the caterpillar to butterfly transition. These these animals start out as a kind of two dimensional. It's a creature that lives in a two dimensional world. It crawls around and eats leaves, and it has a brain that's suitable for that. Eventually, it has to metamorphose into a, a much different animal. So this is like a soft bodied robot. Uh, it has no hard components. This is completely different. The movement types are entirely different. This is a hard bodied creature. It uh, flies in the 3D world, it drinks nectar. And during this process, the brain is basically dissolved. Most of the connections are broken. Most of the cells are killed off. A new brain is rebuilt. But the remarkable part is not only do the butterflies remember the training that, that the caterpillars received, but actually they remap that training with new salience onto a new body plan. Because if you train these caterpillars to associate, for example, a particular color stimulus with leaves, what the, the butterfly doesn't care about leaves. What the butterfly uh, remembers is, is um, to go look for food on those co same color discs. So that information is actually generalized, not leaves, but food, the category food, and remapped onto the new food more appropriate to the different body structure. So this is not just a matter of where does the information stay during brain remodeling. That's the first question. But the second question is how does that information get remapped onto the new life of this individual? And so you can think about what that means, the ability to remap information onto new bodies. Think human augmentation, new embodiments for future humans, brain modification, and how the information is going to persist. So uh, what we have, again, in biology is this multi-scale architecture where all the way from molecular networks all the way up, every layer is a problem-solving system. They're not just uh, structurally um, different size scales. They actually uh, have competencies to solve problems in different spaces. And there are multiple spaces that they operate in, uh, the, the gene transcription spaces, a physiological state space. We're going to spend most of the time talking about this anatomical morphous space. But just to remind us that to, to really be humble about this, because we humans are okay at recognizing the intelligence of medium-sized objects moving at medium speeds in three-dimensional space. So crows and dogs and horses and maybe an octopus, maybe a whale. But uh, we're really not very good at recognizing intelligence in these other spaces because all of our sense organs are very much uh, aimed at this kind of a one narrow range of embodiments. And I often like to think that if we had evolved with uh, a, a primary sensor of our blood chemistry so that you can feel the blood chemistry the way that we currently see and hear and so on, I think we would have no problem uh, recognizing that we live in a high uh, multi-dimensional space and that our liver and our kidneys 
are in fact intelligent uh, agents that navigate that space adaptively all day in terms of all the different things that happen to us. So we're going to uh, look at anatomical morphous space, and, which is basically just a multidimensional space of all the different possible shapes that something could undertake. And we're going to ask a basic question. This is a cross section through a human torso. So look at this amazing order. All these different organs are almost always in the right shape, the right size, next to the right thing. But we start out life like this, a collection of um, embryonic blastomeres. Where does this pattern come from? Where does it encode it? And uh, when I give this, uh, I've, I've given versions of this talk to uh, middle school uh, children and even the nine-year-olds immediately say, oh, it's in the DNA. They say it's in the, it's in the genome. But the thing is, we, we can sequence genomes. Now, it was always clear, really, that this was not in the genome, but uh, a lot of uh, scientists talk as if that's the case. And, and now we know when you read the genome, you don't see any of this, which is protein structure. You see the description of the tiniest molecular hardware that every cell gets to have. You don't see directly information about size, shape, symmetry type. And so we need to understand how do these cells, this genomically specified hardware, how does it know what to build? How does it know when to stop? If something is missing, how do we convince it to rebuild? And as engineers, we want to go one step further and ask, what else could you build? If we wanted to build something completely different out of the same parts, could you? Or uh, this, all this talk of developmental constraints, is that really a, um, a, a confining kind of uh, paradigm? So let's think about what the future uh, is supposed to look like. What's the end game for this field? I think that what we're talking about is something we call an anatomical compiler. So the idea is that someday you will sit down in front of a software system and draw the plant, animal, organ, or biobot that you want to build. In this case, we've drawn a, a three-headed flatworm. So having drawn the anatomy, the functional anatomy that you want, what the system should be able to do is compile that down to a set of stimuli that could be given to cells to build that structure. So not a 3D printer. This is not about uh, micromanaging where the cells go. This is about convincing a group of cells to build exactly what you want them to build and not whatever it was that they were going to build before. So two key questions. First, why do we even need this thing? Because not only for the understanding of evolution and information and so on, but very practically, most biomedical problems, so birth defects, traumatic injury, cancer, aging, degenerative disease, all of these things would go away if we knew how to convince groups of cells to build whatever organs we wanted them to build. Now, the other question might be, why don't we have this yet? Genetics and, and molecular biology has been going gangbusters for, for, for decades. Why do we not have this thing yet? I just want to illustrate one, one simple puzzle. This is the axolotl larva, and baby axolotls have little forelegs. This is a tadpole of the frog. At this stage, these guys do not have forelegs. In my lab, we make something called a frogolotl. So if we make a frogolotl, it's got a bunch of embryonic cells from here, a bunch of embryonic cells from here, and uh, you get a chimeric embryo. Now, the axolotl genome is sequenced. The frog genome has been sequenced. Very simple question. You've got both sequences. Could you tell me whether a frogolotl is going to have legs or not? And the answer is no. We have no way currently of knowing uh, the answer to these kind of questions. In fact, if you didn't already know what a tadpole or an axolotl looked like, you couldn't even give me the shape of it from looking at the genome. It's very important to understand what kind of information we have and what kind of information we do not have. So the state of the field currently is this. We are very good at manipulating cells and molecules. And all of the most exciting advances today are about the hardware. Everybody's really into genomic editing, pathway re remodeling, protein engineering. All of these things are hardware. They're focused at the molecular hardware level, like where computer science was in the 40s and 50s. So this is what programming used to look like. She's physically rewiring this machine. Now, the reason nowadays when you're on your laptop and you want to go from, I don't know, PowerPoint to uh, Microsoft Word, the reason you don't get out your soldering iron and start rewiring is because computer science uh, took advantage of something remarkable. The fact that certain kinds of hardware are reprogrammable and in fact can support a layered, multi-scale, modular uh, set of uh, um, you know, software, or in, in our case, it's going to be physiology, that uh, allows you to do interesting things with the exactly the same piece of hardware without rewiring. So this is what we're missing now. But, but I'm going to argue that molecular medicine is basically here. I spoke to a to a major investor once who said that in their firm they think of they think of biology today where computer science was in in the year 2000. And I think that's that estimate is way wrong. I think it's where we were uh, in the 40s and 50s. We can go much higher than this. And the thing that's still missing is to understand the biological software, is to understand the intelligence that we can take advantage of. So when I say intelligence, what do I, William James's 
nice definition, which is the ability to reach the same goal by different means. It's a very cybernetic definition. It doesn't talk about what kind of brain you have or whether you have a cortex or what space you're even working in. Same goal by different means. The ability to, to reach certain states in that space when faced with interventions, when things change. How much competency do you have to still get your job done? So let's look. What kind of collective intelligence can we find in cellular swarms? What, is the, what, what are the capabilities of our system that we're trying to rewire? What's the toolkit that we have? This is one of my all-time um, favorite examples. This is a cross-section through a, a kidney tubule of a newt and eight to 10 cells normally making this thing up. What, one thing you can do to uh, early embryos is uh, multiply the amount of DNA in their nuclei. So if you can make a polyploid newts that have 2N, 4N, 6N, and so on. If you do that, the cells become larger and you find out that actually you still get the same size newt and that's because fewer cells get together and make the same anatomical structure. So amazing thing number one is that uh, you could have multiple copies of your genome. That doesn't seem to mess anything up. Number two, you could have abnormally large cells and they still figure out how many of them there need to be to do this. But the most amazing thing is that if you make the cells truly gigantic, and I think this is maybe six N newts, if you make the cells truly gigantic, what they will do is wrap around themselves to give you the same anatomical structure. And what's remarkable about that is that this is a different molecular mechanism. This is cell-to-cell -cell communication and tubular genesis. This is cytoskeletal bending. And so in the service of a large-scale anatomical goal, different molecular components are being called up. Now just think about what this means. If you're a newt coming into the world, what, what can you rely on? We tend to think you've had eons of evolution. You've had all this experience with your environment. You can't count on how much DNA you have. You can't count on how many copies of anything you have. You can't count on your cell size. You can't count on how, how many cells you have. You have to be able to get your job done despite massive variation in your own parts. We don't have even the beginnings of technology that has that kind of uh, problem-solving competencies and, and capacity. Um, this, is, this is a more familiar example. Um, we know that uh, embryos reliably go from a single cell to a, a complex organism. But it's not a hardwired process. It's reliable, but it isn't hardwired. Because if you cut these embryos into pieces, you do not end up with half bodies. You end up with monozygotic twins and triplets. So what happens is that from different starting positions, and this is again, call back to James's definition, from different starting positions, you can navigate that morphous space and get to that same ensemble of goal states that, uh, is, that basically um, maps to a normal, a very, you know, normal variation around the human target morphology. In many species, this is not just an embryonic thing. Uh, for example, axolotls can regenerate their legs, their eyes, their jaws, portions of their uh, brain and heart, spinal cord, ovaries. And what happens if, you, if they lose a limb anywhere along this axis, they will rebuild exactly as much as needed, all right? Whether from here or from here, from different starting positions, they get here. And here's the most amazing thing about regeneration. And everybody's excited about cranking up regeneration in, for therapeutic purposes. Actually, the most amazing thing about regeneration is that it stops. How does it know when to stop? It stops when the correct salamander arm has been completed, and that turns out to be very profound. Now, now it's not as if it's, this is just for frogs and, 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 uh, and uh, salamanders and, and flatworms. Um, the human liver is highly regenerative. Uh, even the ancient Greeks knew that. I'm not sure how, but, uh, but they did. Uh, human children regenerate their fingertips uh, below a certain age. And deer, large adult mammals, regenerate uh, a centimeter and a half of new bone per day when they're regrowing their antlers. So massive amount of regeneration of bone, uh, vasculature, innervation, skin. So uh, the final example that I want to show you before we go to the, uh, to the molecular uh, mechanisms is what happens to the frog face. So this is a tadpole face. Here are the eyes, the nostrils, the mouth. And here's what a frog looks like. And so to go from a tadpole to a frog, you need to rearrange the face. These animals, uh, the jaws will move forward, the eyes move, everything moves around. And it used to be thought that this was a, a hardwired set of movements. If you just it could somehow code for every organ to move in a particular direction, a particular amount, then what will happen is you'll go from a normal tadpole to a normal frog. We decided to, to test this and to see actually how much intelligence does this have? And the way you test these things is with perturbations. So what we did was we made a scrambled tadpole called, uh, we call them Picasso tadpoles, where everything is in the wrong place. The eyes on top of the head, the mouth is off to the side. Everything is just uh, completely shuffled. You can think like a Mr. Potato Head doll um, scrambled around. And what happens is that these animals become uh, quite normal frogs, actually, because all of these different things will move in normal paths 
in the, in those uh, rather abnormal paths to get to where they need to go, and then the movement stops. So what the genetics gives you is not a set of hardwired movements. What the genetics actually specifies is a machine that can execute an error minimization scheme. It can uh, continue to remodel until certain conditions are met. So that kind of those kind of data lead us to revise the basic loop of developmental biology. Normally, what you have is there are genes acting in gene regulatory networks. They make some proteins that interact by the laws of physics. All of this is in parallel. And then this magical process of emergence happens and complexity arises and you have this beautiful organism. This view, this is what is focused upon in developmental biology textbooks, is an open loop feed forward process that rides along via emergence of complexity. And it is certainly true that there are many systems that will give you complexity from the repeated application of simple rules. There's plenty of that, but that's not uh, where the magic is here. Uh, because what we find, uh, which, which, is, which is a property that is not shared by all the computational models of, of feed-forward emergence and complexity, is that if you deviate from this target morphology, and that can be with injury, it can be with mutations, with teratogens. In fact, one can uh, propose that actually this kind of anatomical homeostasis and regenerative capacity was not about injury to start with. The reason this evolution has this is because this is how uh, it was able to deal with mutations. The fact that you know that in your lineage, you are going to experience changes of your internal parts. And if you can't deal with that, you're not going to um, live very long as a lineage. So what happens when you deviate from this, from this target morphology is that some mechanisms kick in both at the level of physics and genetics to try to reduce the error. It's literally, it's like a thermostat in your house. It's, a, it's an error minimization kind of process. Now, this is on, on the one hand, what your biologists know all about homeostatic loops. And of course, we recognize them in terms of pH regulation and temperature and hunger and all that. But there's a couple of unique things here. One is that uh, first of all, the set point of this homeostatic process is not a single number. It's not a scalar like, like for hunger or pH. It's a some kind of simplified version of a complex three-dimensional shape. How, how could we possibly store um, shape in a group of cells so that they know what they're supposed to build? Now, how do we store this set point? And then the other thing is that in developmental biology and cell biology, really discouraged from talking about goals and those kinds of uh, teleological models. You're supposed to talk about chemistry and the way that chemistry rolls forward to, to produce emergent complexity. But it's really critical to realize now that since the 40s, we've had in cybernetics and control theory, we've had a mature science of machines with goals. It is no longer magical magical thinking to say that these kind of processes have goals. It, it, that better be true because we are also we also consist of these kind of processes. And if they cannot support a goal-directed behavior, then, then, then it's unclear what, what to say about our cognition either. This kind of weird view of looking at it to say that the development is actually a goal-directed process that moves towards a kind of target morphology uh, makes a couple of predictions. It means that we should be able to find that mechanism it means that we should be able to decode it and rewrite it. And if we rewrite it, something amazing becomes possible. It means that in order to make changes here, let's say for regenerative medicine, we don't need to change the genes. And that's really good because it is almost never clear how you would change the genes. Even if CRISPR worked perfectly, which it will at some point, the question is, which genes do you change to make the edits that you want out here? Instead of doing that, we could change the pattern memory and let the cells do what they do best, which is build to it. So now, so let's, and so we've now for a couple of decades, we've been pushing this idea and, and exploring the predictions of this goal-directed view. So the first question we needed to, to ask is where could these pattern memories be stored? And we already have one clear example of collections of cells that store complex patterns as uh, endpoints of goal-directed behavior, and that would be the brain. So in the brain, we know you have uh, electrical networks of cells that pr um, produce action um, potentials and uh, voltage gradients via ion channels across their surface. We call that VMEM, the resting potential. And that supports an amazing kind of software. And here you can see the in, uh, in vivo physiology of a zebrafish brain, we, where people in neuroscience try to do neural decoding. They, the commitment of neuroscience is that if you could understand this physiology, you'd be able to decode the goals, memories, preferences, and so on of this kind of system. All the cognitive uh, kinds of content you should be able to decode from this electrical activity. It turns out that uh, nature really uh, figured out that the electrical networks are really good for this kind of thing very early on. Uh, electrical networks are not about um, neurons. They were here from the time of bacterial biofilms. And all cells in your body have ion channels and make uh, resting potential gradients. 
most of these uh, cells are connected to each other through electrical synapses known as gap junctions. And could we run the same kind of research program? Could we look at, for example, in this case, an early frog embryo and uh, read out the electrical information and ask, what could the cellular collective be thinking about? We, we know what this cellular collective thinks about. It largely thinks about movement through three-dimensional space. But embryos move through anatomical morphous space. So could we understand how the earlier version of this uh, electrical system was used to compute and to move us through morphous space? So um, in our group, we developed uh, several uh, different kinds of tools. First, to read uh, these patterns. And so here is a voltage-sensitive dye in time-lapse showing you all the uh, electrical conversations that these cells are having with each other to sort out where uh, the different organs of the frog embryo are going to be. We do a lot of computational modeling to tie the molecular biology together with uh, the voltage gradients that we observe and, and ask questions about a pattern completion. So if a part is deleted, how does the network remember the whole and so on? Uh, I'm going to show you two, two uh, uh, um, uh, example patterns of this. So this is what we call the electric face. And this is a pattern of voltage. Again, the colors uh, indicate resting potential. Um, that this is this is one frame of uh, the process by which uh, this uh, embryo puts his face together. And you can already see where everything is going to be. The right eye is going to be here. The placodes are out here. The mouth is going to be here. This is a subtle bioelectric pre-pattern that tells these cells where to turn on the genes, if they have frizzled, BMPs, and so on, to pattern the face. And it's absolutely required. If you change this pattern, the face changes. I'm going to show you that in a minute. Now, that's a normal pattern. There's also pathological patterns, such as when you inject an oncogene, you can actually detect the defection of these cells from the large-scale bioelectrical network and, and the impending metastasis and tumor genesis. You can see that here. So beyond reading and recording these kind of patterns, the key is to do functional perturbations, to do interventions. And so for that reason, we developed some tools to now write the content into that electrical pattern. So just to link all of this back to the key concept from the beginning of the talk, we are literally treating the collective of cells during morphogenesis as a collective intelligence, which exerts behavior in anatomical morphous space. It moves the configuration of the body from that of a single cell to some, whatever the complex animal it is or plant. And the idea is that this is literally behavior just in a different space. And we now want to read the mind, read and write the primitive mind of that collective intelligence. So how do we do this? No magnets, electromagnetic fields, electrodes, radiations, nothing like that. We uh, hijack the native bioelectrical interface that these cells are using to hack each other. So that is uh, the ion channels and the gap junctions that, that they express. So we basically steal all the tools from neuroscience. So this is um, ion uh, channel drugs and optogenetics and various uh, manipulations of these channels that you can use to control the voltage pattern in this tissue. When you do that, several things happen. Initially, this, this work, for example, this eye story was published in 2010. Initially, when we said we wanted to change the resting potential of cells, the background assumption was going to be that what you'll get is uninterpretable toxicity and death because voltage was thought to be a housekeeping parameter. And I want to show you actually what it really does. So what we do here is we inject some, in this particular case, we inject some RNA encoding a, a set of potassium channels. What they can do with the cells they end up in once the proteins are made is set a voltage, a little a pattern of voltage that looks like that eye spot that I just showed you in the electric face. So when you do that, whichever cells get that pattern, they are instructed by that pattern to build an eye. And so here you have eye uh, made from cells that were supposed to be gut. If you section those eyes, you get a lens, retina, optic nerve, all the right stuff. So here we learn some interesting things. First of all, that the bioelectric pattern is instructive. It actually calls up new eyes. It's not just that we messed it up and then the cells died and, and there's toxicity. No, it's actually instructive. You can call up healthy new organs by specific bioelectric patterns. It's modular. We didn't have to tell these cells how to build an eye. In fact, we have no idea how to build an eye. What we found is a high-level subroutine, a, um, uh, basically a, a high-level trigger that tells them to build an eye and they take care of the rest. It also, we, we also find that actually th there's this, uh, this prompt uh, of this bioelectric pattern reveals more competency in these cells because, cells because in the developmental biology textbook, it will tell you that 
only the anterior neurectoderm here is competent to make eye. And that's true if you prompt them with the PAC6 so-called master regulator eye gene. But, but actually, these cells are perfectly competent. It's just that um, nobody had prompted them with a more convincing stimulus. And so this, again, reminds us to be humble in the sense that every assessment of the competency of some system is basically us taking an IQ test ourselves. It's what are we able to discover about that system? And we need to be really cautious in putting limits on things when we haven't fully understood what the system is capable of. And finally, what I also really like about this is this amazing property of self-scaling. So this is a lens sitting out in the flank of a uh, tadpole somewhere. The blue cells are the ones that we injected. But look, the rest of the lens is made of clear cells that we never touched directly. So what's happening here is that these cells got the message that they should build an eye, but there's not enough of them. And what they do is they recruit a bunch of their completely normal neighbors, so secondary instruction, to help them in this task. And of course, we already know there are other collective intelligences that do this, for example, ants. So if a couple of ants find something that's too heavy for them to lift, what they'll do is recruit others to come and, uh, to come and help. So collective intelligences tend to have this self-scaling property and, and the cells do it. We've deployed this idea of high-level triggers for very complex events for leg regeneration uh, purposes. So frogs unlike salamanders, do not regenerate their legs. And so if they lose a leg 45 days later, there's nothing. We uh, came up with a cocktail, and this was uh, Kelly Cheng's work, where what she did was uh, treat them for 24 hours, and it immediately induces a bunch of pro-regenerative genes. And then and by 45 days, you get some toes, you get a toenail, eventually a pretty nice leg that is touch sensitive and motile. Our, our latest uh, paper shows uh, one day of treatment followed by a year and a half of leg growth in the mature, fully adult frog. That's, again, this notion of, a, of an early decision-making intervention. We're not there to micromanage the stem cells or tell any of the cells where they should go or what the gene expression should be. We, we have no idea how to do that, and I don't think we will for a really long time. But what we can do is discover the prompts, the stimuli that get the system to uh, undergo comp certain complex behaviors, morphogenetic behaviors. So here I should do a disclosure because David Kaplan and I have this spinoff company called Morphoceuticals. And what we are doing now is trying this technology in mammals, hopefully eventually towards, towards human patients, but we're nowhere near human patients yet. The idea is to use a, a wearable bioreactor, a, an aqueous environment in which we control the bioelectric and other states of these cells and get them to commit early on to a leg growing behavior versus a scarring behavior. Okay, the next quick story I'm going to tell you is about planaria. And so here are these flatworms. And perhaps one of the most interesting things about these flatworms is that they are immortal. So these theories of aging that say that we are, that aging is inevitable, that because it's a kind of accumulation of, of mistakes and entropic loss and so on, I think they cannot be correct. These, the asexual strains of these animals do not age. Nobody's ever seen an old asexual planarian. They just continuously regenerate, regenerate their bodies. And you might ask a question, if you amputate the head and the tail and you have this middle fragment, how does that middle fragment know how many heads it's supposed to have? Like right here, this piece is going to grow a head and then the same, the near neighbor cells here are actually going to grow a tail. Why do they do different things? How does this thing know what, how many heads each fragment is supposed to have? And so we found an electric circuit, which was, maintains a pattern like this that says one head, one tail. And if you cut this reliably, you get one headed worms. And if we rewrite that electrical information using ion channel drug exposure, just for the first uh, few hours, what it'll do is set a voltage pattern that's like this and it holds. And then if you later cut this animal, this perfectly normal, anatomically correct looking animal with normal gene expression, normal anatomy will then regenerate as two heads because that is what its pattern memory says. So I, I promised you early on in the talk that we are going to find and rewrite the literal pattern memories that the tissue has about what it's supposed to build, what it's supposed to look like. This is it. You're looking at it. These are much scans you might do of a brain. This is the collective intelligence of these cells, maintains a memory. We can read that memory. And this is what this animal now thinks a proper planarian should look like. That doesn't, it doesn't come into effect until it's injured and the cells are called upon to read that memory until then it's, it's latent. So this is a, this is actually a counterfactual memory. The collective intelligence of cells is able to hold counterfactual memories. That's a pretty advanced uh, capacity actually. Um, why do I keep calling it a memory? Because if we take this two headed animal and we cut off the primary head, we cut off this ectopic secondary head. You might think that it should go back to normal. After all, the, geno the genomic information is the same. We, we didn't touch the genome. There's no, no editing here. 
no transgenes, uh, you might think that it should go back to normal, but in fact, it doesn't. These animals continue to generate two-headed animals in perpetuity. The first two-headed worms uh, caused by a, induced by a different uh, mechanism were seen around 1903 by Thomas Hunt Morgan. Between that time and 2009, no, nobody had recut them to our knowledge because it seemed completely obvious of what would happen. The genetics are unchanged. Of course, it'll go back to normal. Why would you recut them? And only this, and, and so the reason I mentioned this is because this, the conceptual part matters. It, it defines what experiments uh, you are going to do, the way you think about this, and whether you think of genetics as uh, specifying uh, in a hardwired way what the outcome is versus as a, as a kind of reprogrammable medium where you might say, I wonder if the memory has been reprogrammed. And in fact, that's what happens here. So this has all the properties of memory. It's long-term stable. It's uh, rewritable. It has conditional recall, which I just showed you. And here are these uh, two-headed animals um, hanging out. Not only can you make animals with the wrong number of heads, but you can make this way animals with heads from other species. So this is a triangular-headed uh, Dugesia doradocephala. You cut off the head, perturb the bioelectric circuit, and you can end up with flat heads like a P. felina. You can end up with round heads like an S. mediterranea, or of course, the normal heads. Not just the head shape, but the distribution of stem cells, the shape of the brain. And so th these other species sit in these attractors in the state space, uh, in the anatomical space, state space naturally. But you can convince this hardware to visit those regions without any genetic reprogramming. The exact same normal hardware can actually visit those other regions of anatomical state space. Now, you can go well beyond that. And we've made these kind of crazy spiky shaped things, these cylinders. This is not even a flat like a planarian supposed to be combina combination forms. And so now we have to start thinking about what is the space of possibilities for these. In developmental biology, we hear a lot about developmental constraints as if there were things that cells cannot build. We actually have no idea what cells can and cannot build. So let's just take a look at this uh, simple fact that we, we are not the only bioengineers. So here's a, a cool plant example. I'm obsessed with these galls lately, but this is, this is what the acorn normally builds. Okay, so this is the oak leaf. And if all you look at is this, you will get the idea that this is incredibly reliable and that what the oak genome does is specify this. This is what it can do. But along comes a parasite. This is a, a wasp of a particular type. And the wasp is an interesting bioengineer. What it has, the lineage of the wasp, not the individual wasps, but the evolutionary lineage has learned is how to prompt these cells, perfectly normal, not genetically edited cells, to build something completely different. This, this big round, spiky red and yellow thing is made of these cells, okay? Because they were prompted by this bioengineer. Would we have any clue that these cells are capable of building something like this? And we'd have no idea if we didn't already see that this was here. So we have to understand now that um, the reliability of hereditary is, is, is really deceiving because it, it keeps us from realizing what the space of possibilities are. Um, and that um, bioprompting in this way is actually really powerful and uh, can let you do things that micromanagement cannot let you do. So in our group, we're trying for this kind of full stack approach where you start with the molecular biology that tells you which ion channels are present, and then bioelectric uh, sim uh, simulators to understand tissue level bio bioelectric patterns and where they come from. And then dynamic properties of these patterns. If we cut the animal, do they rescale? Do they restore? What, do they have memory? Do they have plasticity? And from there to basically algorithmic models of how large scale anatomical decisions are going to be made. And once you have some of those models in hand, you can do rational interventions. So this is a normal frog brain, forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain. And under a variety of teratogens, this can be, be messed up. So for example, from nicotine, you can see the, the difference here between this brain and this. And so we asked, okay, is there any hope that using this bioelectrical information, we can actually restore something as complex as this? You might think that what you'd have to do is tattoo every single cell with the appropriate information to get back into this very specific pattern. So we made a computational model. This is Alexis Pytak and Vipav Pai um, in my group uh, did this. And uh, they made this model and they asked, okay, under a scenario like this, w when things have gone wrong, what can we do to the bioelectrical gradient to get back to normal? And the model actually suggested one particular ion channel, which is called HCN2. And that channel has some really interesting properties that I don't have time to get into here. But one of the things it does is restore sharp bioelectrical patterns, it restore borders between, between adjacent compartments. And what that does is able to, able to repair even genetic defects. So here's a normal brain. Here's the brain of a tadpole with a notch, a dominant notch mutant. So you can see the forebrain is gone. The midbrain and hindbrain are a big bubble. 
And even on that background, if you also uh, give it uh, either HCN2 RNA or a couple of human approved drugs that are HCN2 openers, these animals will end up with a normal brain structure, normal brain uh, gene expression, and normal IQs. If you test them on learning rates, they're indistinguishable from controls. So I'm not arguing that we can always fix genetic errors, but in some cases, you can fix hardware defects in software. So an exposure of this animal with a really powerful notch mutation to a drug that was picked by a computational platform restores a complex organ. So the future, as we see it, is a workflow like this where there's a bunch of information on of health and disease. And this is not, a, this, these data, by the way, are not available. We're just gearing up now to, to let this kind of physiology catch up to the omics kind of a data sets that exist for protein and RNA. And then we can ask which kinds of ion uh, flow states would restore the correct pattern. And then it becomes uh, fairly straightforward to find drugs that will do that. And so you can play with this. The early version of that platform is, is here. Okay, so I'm just going to I'm going to wrap up by saying a couple of uh, big, big picture things. We know that both evolution and development have scaled. What what they've fundamentally done is scaled the size of goals. So these little tiny uh, creatures, microbes, and single cells have little tiny goals. Their cognitive light cones, or the size of the goals that they're able to produce and when work towards, are basically right around the size of themselves. They don't care what happens in the environment. They just they care about the internal. Uh, physiological states. But, but here in this kind of system, their tiny little goals have been inflated towards a very grandiose construction project, making a whole limb. We know it's a goal because if you deviate them from that goal, they will work very hard. They will spend all kinds of energy to rebuild. And when they reach that goal, they stop. And so now, whereas here there are tiny little goals in physiological and transcriptional state space, here you have much larger goals in anatomical state space. But that, that amazing uh, set of uh, mechanisms, which we can t talk about if people have questions, the, the, the set of mechanisms that allow the scaling of goals has a failure, uh, failure mode. That failure mode is cancer. So this is glioblastoma. Individual cells can disconnect from the electrical network. And at that point, they roll back to be amoebas. They are not more selfish. It's just that their selves are smaller. Quite literally, the self here is, is, is very large. This is the kind of goals that it can pursue. These are tiny little um, selves here looking out for themselves. And so, so we have developed ways to not only detect this process early, so this is hopefully a diagnostic modality for the future, but also to, to suppress it because instead of killing these cells, so here is, here's, this is the same animal here. This tadpole is injected with a, a human, a nasty human oncogene, for example, a, a, a P53 mutation or a KRAS or something. And the, the oncoprotein is very strongly expressed. In fact, it's all over the place here. It's we labeled it, but there is no tumor. And that's because we co-injected an ion channel that forces these cells to stay in electrical communication with their neighbors. That's it. it we, we don't regulate any of the other processes. We just reconnect it to the large scale network that remembers that you should be working on the skin and muscle and, and things like that and not making a tumor. That means that we can think about next generation biomedicine at, from the perspective of the protocognitive capacity of the material that we are trying to repair. So not just micromanagement, but actually all the way through the scales of the system, perhaps guided by our computational platforms and various AI wrappers on top of that, we can ask what is the most efficient interaction interface. And I think biology and evolution work so well precisely because they don't micromanage. Evolution makes problem-solving machines at multiple scales, and it is uh, hacking at every level. Every cell is trying to hack every other cell uh, and tissues. And they're all trying to hack themselves, by the way, to get them to, to do adaptive things despite the various problems in the environment. And so that means that we can take advantage of this. All of this stuff, right? The ability to sense, to amplify signals, to generalize, discriminate, learn, and ultimately solve problems. Instead of building them from scratch ourselves, as we now do with robotics, we can take advantage of a billion uh, years of, uh, of, of optimizing these kind of capacities. And so we can think, now let's think about something else. Not only is our target, so the patient or the bioengineer tissue, not only is our target somewhat, somewhat somewhere up here in this, in this spectrum, but actually our intervention could be too. Right now we use drugs. Drugs are, for the most part, are extremely dumb. They are very simple machines. They only do the one thing they do. They bind whatever targets uh, they're going to bind, and that's it. And that's very and that's very limiting. Some kind of smart intervention. And yes, it could be an implanted a piece of engineering, like a smart insulin pump or something like that. But here's a different way to think about it. So let's take a look at let's take a look at this thing. So here it is running around. If I were to ask you what that was, 
you might say that this is, we got this from a pond somewhere, a, a primitive organism from the bottom of a lake. And if you were to sequence the genome, you would find out something pretty wild. The genome is 100% homo sapiens. Okay. So what you're looking at here is something we call an anthrobot. It's a new, it's a next version of our xenobots, which are a biological, self-motile biological constructs made from frog cells. These are made from human patient cells. There is no genetic modification here. There are no weird nanomaterials. There is no, no transgenes, no circuits. So far, you, we can add all those things and we will as needed. But for now, we're really interested in the, the baseline competencies, the plasticity. And so there's a protocol that causes these little guys to, to develop uh, up here. They start to, they're basically lung organoids and then they, we get them to turn inside out. And then you see what they really do when your lung epithelium gets to reboot its multicellularity and have a new life. And so they become these highly multi little creatures that have all kinds of uh, capacities. Here's one navigating a scratch through a bunch of uh, neural tissue. So all this gray stuff out here is iPSC derived human neural, uh, neural tissue. It's a lawn and we made this, this scratch through it and, and you could see it moving. Now, now it's moving through this. What might be the interactions between the anthrobot and these, in this tissue here? If you let a bunch of them settle down, we call this a super bot or a bridge bot. Uh, because there's a bunch of them together. If you let them settle down, what you find is that over about four days, what they do is they knit the two sides of the, of the wound together. And this is what it looks like. Now, whoever would have thought that your tracheal cell sitting quietly in your, in your, in your lungs and, and in your trachea uh, for decades, that given uh, a new environment, they would be able to uh, reboot their multi multicellularity in a way that not only lets them move around and do other interesting things, but actually exert healing capacity on your other cells. Your tracheal cells have the capacity to fix peripheral innervation. What else do they know how to do? We have no idea. This was the first thing we tried. This was not test number 78 out of a thousand different things we tried. This was the first thing. So I'm going to assume that we're not just extremely lucky to find the one thing that they know how to do. There's actually a ton of capabilities here. And the other interesting thing is that as a kind of intervention, right, something that might someday be personalized medicine bots made from your own cells to go into your own body, no immune suppression needed to, to do repairs to clean out your arteries, drop off the pro-regenerative molecules as a million applications. But the cool thing is that unlike, let's say, nanorobotics or something else where we build it directly, these guys are, they're your own cells. They share all the priors with your body about what health and disease is, what inflammation is, what cancer is, and so on. These are not things we have to build into them from scratch. So the last thing I want to say is that moving forward, the field of biomedical interventions, this is what's currently on the table. So these kind of bottom-up interventions of surgery and stem cells and all this stuff. But there's this whole other gigantic uh, set of approaches coming, which are top-down, which has to do with not only behavior shaping, we haven't even talked about this, but we have uh, some, some really interesting approaches to training cells and tissues and these agential implants, and then various kinds of morphoceuticals that speak to the anatomical intelligence. And so these are just some examples of what's actually coming. So my guess is, oh, and you can see the details in these reviews. So my guess is that uh, future medicine is going to look a lot more like psychiatry than it's going to look like chemistry. We are really talking about exploiting the tools and the insights of neuroscience, very deep insights of neuroscience beyond neurons to understand multi-scale intelligent systems. And I think we can, the ability to hack this for transformative uh, health applications is massive. I will just thank all of the people that uh, are, are, are um, doing the work that I mentioned uh, here today, the various postdocs and students, uh, all the technical support, our many amazing collaborators, our, our funders who, uh, who support this stuff. Um, again, disclosures, there's three companies uh, that fund um, some of this work here. And um, uh, Jeremy Gay, who did a lot of the illustrations that I just showed you, and most of all, um, the animal model systems, because uh, they really have the hardest job of all here. So um, I will stop here and answer questions. Thank you so much. That was another mind blower. <laughs> Thank you so much. I know we're over time now, but and I, it's really difficult to synthesize all of the questions from the chat. Honestly, I have no, I'm not even going to try to do this. But I think for this group in particular, perhaps what's most interesting is if you were thinking about what people in this group could do to either, you know, improve work on the more electroceutical notion uh, of what you mentioned or on the uh, agenda implant notion of what you mentioned. Like, where do you think are currently open challenges where people like maybe come from more of a biology aging background can like most help or like how could they most help draw these applications um, uh, in, into the field? What's yeah. outstanding there? What's left to do? Yeah, what's left to do? There's a lot left to do, but but let's let's just talk about the aging thing in particular. So the theory of of aging that that we have been playing with is this idea that 
if you think about anatomical homeostasis, the ability uh, to the need to uh, continuously work towards maintaining a shape, that doesn't stop in adulthood, right? Once you've built the body, cells are dying and being reborn all the time. It has to, you have to work pretty hard to stay in the same in one place. So that, that, that morphostasis is happening all the time. But that requires having information about what the body is supposed to look like. If you're going to resist the drift of noise and aging and then cancer and so on, it requires you to have a crisp memory of the target morphology. And could it be that during aging that what happens is that uh, there's a degradation of the target of morphology pattern memory? Maybe the pattern memory gets fuzzy. And we know when it when, when in development, if we make it fuzzy, development goes to heck and you get birth defects. In adulthood, if it gets fuzzy, I think what that looks like is aging. And so our approach currently is to think about ways to uh, re, basically to sharpen that pattern and to refine that information. And so this means really d developing not only the conceptual tools around aging as a defect of geometry, not a fundamental biochem. And of course, it might be multiple things. I'm not saying this is the only useful model, but to really develop the conceptual apparatus around this and then to build new tools. So we need more. Uh, but we need better ways to do voltage imaging in vivo. So there's a lot of technology development there. We need all kinds of efforts uh, for uh, a better um, ion channel drugs, better computational models. Physiomics is huge, uh, as a huge need. We simply do not know um, what all the correct voltage states are for health and disease in different organs at different ages. So acquiring that data set is, is something that, that we are going to do. It's very important. It hasn't been done because molecular biology and biochemistry, they can work with dead tissue. So you fractionate your cells, you get your protein, your RNA, whatever, and, and it's fine. You can make a list of what you have. Bioelectricity doesn't work that way. This, the, the, as soon as the cell is dead, this is gone. You cannot do this in non-living tissue. So this, so all of this has to be in vivo and, and it's quite difficult. So those are just some of the, some of the challenges that, that we're facing now. All right. Thanks. I don't know. Do you have to hop off? It's already I have, oh, I, I have to, I have till 2.15, so I have another 10 minutes. Okay. Okay. Then let me get with, I think, Micah, your question was highly uploaded. If you want to unmute your thoughts on the long term, I, I can also otherwise ask it. Yeah, sure. So I think you answered it, but I was wondering if you can go into a little more detail on how do we get to a place where we can image a living human and read its bioelectrical state? Like right now, people are doing this with brains and then they plug the output into an AI and the AI is now learning how to interpret what that means. Presumably, we want to do the same thing with the bioelectric network of the whole body. What is the path to get there technologically or like what research needs to be done? It's very similar to the question Allison asked. Yeah, the straightforward path is going to be to develop. So right now we have voltage sensitive dyes that can give us the bioelectric state of cells you can see, but obviously the majority of the body are cells you cannot see. So some kind of improved bioelectric re-imaging technology that can let us read uh, the state of deep tissues. And, and then, of course, the computational models to, to go from the, an understanding of the patterns of health and disease to how to turn the diseased ones into the healthy ones. Now, that's the straightforward way. I, I happen to think there's a shortcut, and I think the shortcut is going to be around understanding the higher level information processing in these, in these networks. In other words, I really don't think in the end we're going to be micromanaging the bioelectric state any more than I want to micromanage uh, the molecular state. I think it's going to be the equivalent of what we do in behavior science. If you want, if, if you have a rat and you want him to do a little circus trick, one way is to try to play the body like a puppet and control every neuron and try to get him to walk and do the various things. But the much easier way is to train the rat because the rat offers this amazing interface called learning, which enables you to give rewards and punishments. And you don't have to know the details of which neurons are doing what. I, I, I think it's going to end up like this. I think we're going to, once we figure out what actual protocognitive uh, capacities these electrical networks have, we're going to develop a kind of somatic training protocols where you can give them stimuli. And, and it's not going to be about knowing which cells have which voltage is going to be a much higher level intervention. But stay tuned for about that. We're still working that out. We have Ben Moskowitz next. Hey, oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. I was wondering if, I, I guess like what we were just saying about like the brain dynamics of um, being able to read the states and then be more predictive uh, from experimentation. Um, like for the planaria um, to be able to modify their head generation to be able to say two heads, four heads, something like this in the construction, um, you need to be able to manipulate the electrical networks. Um, to guide the cells like towards that goal that you want. So do you have a systematic way to approach that problem currently? 
or is it mostly through experimentation and like once we collect the larger data set, it'll be able to be much more like AI driven or something like that? Yeah, up until now, the only path that we've had is to observe natural patterns and try to infer. So if you want to know what bioelectric pattern kicks off eye development, you look early on in the embryo before the eye comes up and that, oh, wow, there's an eye spot and that's the pattern that kicks it off. You can do the same for limb. You can do the same for the brain. So we've now done it in, I don't know, half a dozen different contexts. It's extremely uh, difficult and time consuming. And I am hoping, and we're working on uh, some of this to, uh, to develop automated uh, robot scientist platforms that together with improved bioelectric uh, uh, characterization machinery, better dyes, maybe CAT scan uh, reagents and so on that are voltage sensitive, we can automate that process, make it high throughput, and really then from there use AI and maybe con conventional analysis tools to extract an understanding of the bioelectric code. That's what we call it, is cracking the bioelectric code. For now, our number of examples is quite low. And so all we can do is look at normal embryos, normal regeneration, normal tumor genesis, and, and try to learn from that. But I think ultimately we would like to scan the whole many species, many different ages, many different disease conditions, and from that figure out what actually the encoding is top to bottom. That's ambitious. Okay, Shruti, you next. Hi, it was an amazing talk. Thank you so Thank much, you so Michael. Much. I was wondering what else are we missing? Bioelectricity is, of course, one aspect, but also there must be other forces, right? Electromagnetism, oh. light waves, sound waves, some weak nuclear forces. I'm not able to think all of them, but like all of these exist in nature and I'm yep. sure they must exist in the body as well. Uh, yep. Are there any labs that are working on this or tools that are present to even start testing these things? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. And and we think about this stuff all the time in the sense I encourage my, my students and, and postdocs to ask, what would we be missing yeah, using the approaches and more importantly, the, the conceptual tools that we have, what would they absolutely not see? Right? And so you got your known unknowns and your unknown unknowns. So I can't say anything about the unknown unknowns, because but for the known unknowns, there's a few things. So we know that we really don't understand yet um, the phenomenon, phenomenon of mitogenetic radiation, so ultra weak photon emission. So there are some good labs that work on this. Uh, cells are exchanging. Uh, light and uh, other kinds of electromagnetic radiation with each other. We don't know what it does. We don't have good tools for it, but uh, I'm, I'm going to guess that it's probably quite important. There may be sound, vibrate, vibratory kind of things that happen. The nuclear envelope has an electrical potential across it. We haven't even begun to scratch what implications that might have for, for gene expression. In fact, all the organelles have, all the membrane-bound organelles have voltages. So yeah, bio, the biophysics is, I'm sure, has tons of surprises for us. In fact, we can go in the opposite direction instead of looking down into these organelles, like we found recently that actually embryos talk to each other. So whole embryos, so groups of embryos make a, a what I call a hyper embryo, where the whole large collections of embryos can solve problems that individual embryos cannot. And they have their own gene expression profiles that, that small groups of embryos don't have and so on. So there are many surprises here. And yeah, some of these are being studied and some we don't even know about. Okay, maybe we have time for one more. For you know, you had yeah, end up for a long time, if you want to go for it. Um, sure, yes. Thank you, Teresa. Talk as usual, Mike. Thank you. Just, I'm trying to get my uh, head around this. When you reconstitute an eye, let's say in the planaria, yeah. uh, you, you're setting up some... Um, bioelectric pattern and you said you're changing uh, the the channel the ion channel states of a few cells and then they communicate to the other surrounding cells right something like that i'm probably watching this up so i'm just curious do you have to when you do that do you have to target specific cells and how many cells do you actually uh, manipulate and then how many other cells do they have to interact with yeah, it's a great question. It depends on the scenario. So for example, we have one scenario where we can induce uh, melanoma in these tadpoles without any kind of genetic damage, no oncogenes, just by disrupting the electrical communication. That takes about three cells. It only takes about three cells to do that. In the case of the eye, it's actually quite interesting because when you establish these cells that want to be eye, all of their neighbors are telling them, you're wrong, you should be skin. 
And they have this debate back and forth and we can see it. We can literally see it because if you, I, I had this experience right, right from the beginning, I, I tried to, I wanted to make the whole embryo one giant eye. Okay. So I would, ju I, ju I just wanted one, I wanted to turn every cell into an eye. So I, I shot it up with a ton of the, this potassium channel RNA and you look at the embryos and I was using a, a, a transgenic that, that is actually glows where um, the master eye gene is turned on. So I look at this thing and I see seven spots and I was like, cool, this tadpole is going to have seven eyes. And then you look the next day and it's, oh, wait, it's only four. And the next day, wait, it's only two. And the next day, you're lucky if you get one. So what's happening is that all the other cells, this one cell is saying, let's build an eye. And all the others are saying, you're crazy, we're skin. And depending on who wins, they have this back and forth interaction, depending on who wins. And it's a cancer suppression mechanism. You don't want a lot of cells with weird voltages around. So in that case, it actually, there is a threshold. I don't have an exact number for you, but there is a threshold where if, you don't, if you're not in that threshold, the other cells are going to wipe out what you're trying to do. Mike, thank you so much. I know we've kept you one minute over. I'm very mindful of your time. This was absolutely mind-boggling as usual. I can't wait to have you back whenever you're ready. And uh, thanks everyone for your great questions. This was absolutely fantastic. Thank you. I'll see you for the next one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Anytime we can have an in-depth talk about bots, aging, whatever you want. So thanks everyone.